Hello Church, this is Pastor Lisa and I'm doing the recordings from our Lenten service, uh, Lenten series, and this is the story of Jesus. This was done on Good Friday and it is done as a funeral service. The scripture that I'm using is John 15 verses 12 through 17. And this is my commandment, love each other as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. You are my friend if you do what I command. I don't call on you servants any longer, because servants don't know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, because everything I heard from my father I have been, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you could go and produce fruit. And know that you, and so that your fruit could last. As a result, whatever you ask the Father in my name, I will give you. I will give you these commandments so that you can love one, love each other. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph of Nazareth while they were sojourning in Bethlehem. During Herod's great taxation, his parents lived in Egypt for a number of years. When he was a small boy, they moved back to Nazareth so Jesus could grow up among his extended friends and family. The highlight of his childhood was on a family trip to Jerusalem for Passover when he was 12 years old. Jesus decided he was not ready to go home. The problem is, is he didn't tell his children. He forgot to inform, it, or he forgot to inform his parents who only discovered that he was not with the return caravan when they were many miles from the city. His parents never let him forget it, maybe in response to that experience. He never strayed too far from home until he was in his 30s, and he lived, lived a very quiet life. While Jesus never married, he was involved in the lives of his extended family, their children, and the family carpentry business. And Jesus was a big support for his mother Mary in her grief after his father's passing. And when Jesus was in his early 30s, a visit to his cousin John changed the course of his life. After his visit, he left Nazareth to lead an unsettled life, never having a home of his own again. He became a big tra traveler, passing through Galilee and Judea, even into Samaria and the land beyond the Jordan. His family hoped he would get over his traveling bug and settle down and raise a family, but that was not to be. Jesus was a person with a special light, a light from God, like the prophets of old. He traveled because he had a message from God. He had to tell people about what he called the kingdom of God. He was a powerful speaker, enthralling the young and the old and the rich and the poor alike. With his insight and wisdom, he spoke to us of the great compassion of God and that we too should love one for another. In the course of Jesus' travel, he came to have twelve special friends, whom he called his disciples, as well as numerous followers, both men and women, who generously provided for his needs out of their own resources. Jesus was the type of person who was always having interesting encounters with people. If you tried to write down everything he did, the world could not contain all the stories. He could make friends with anyone, tax collectors, people who possessed by demons, the educated, the rich, the people who were blind, the lame, the lepers, the Pharisees, the Samaritans. Jesus was interested in everyone. He was the kindest man, the most loving man, a person who had special powers to get given to him by God. And those of you who were here, who have seen the power of his miracles, know exactly what I'm talking about. In the final years of his life, Jesus became famous with thousands flocking to hear him speak. And some believed him to be the Messiah, the chosen one of Israel. And while he was deeply loved, he also had so many, he had some very bitter enemies. People who were threatened by his sometimes biting honesty. He also became famous and he attracted the re, the the attention of the religious leaders and the political leaders, and they plotted to kill him. One of his own disciples, who we will not talk about today, and God have mercy on his soul, betrayed him. Jesus was arrested, and he was tried before Pontius Pilate, and up to the end, there was some among us who had hoped for this grand display of God's power. 
and that Jesus would begin to speak and amaze all who heard him, as he amazed us for so long. But he didn't open his mouth in those final days. And those who saw him in his final hours described someone who was resolute in his faith, still talking to God, even as he was executed by crucifixion as a common criminal. He died just outside of the city of Jerusalem that he loved on the Friday before Passover. Left to grieve his passing are his mother Mary, his brother James and various in-laws, his aunt Mary, the wife of Clopas, many cousins, nieces, and nephews, and his eleven special followers, and so many friends. He was predeceased by his father, Joseph, and his cousin John the Baptizer. And while Jesus had no children of his own, he made he never made and he never made much money, or he bought any land of his own. He left a mark that will never be forgotten, and he will be remembered forever in the hearts of those who loved him. A tribute from Peter. I did not want to get up here, but the other disciples said that I must. I had to go. And so I'm speaking for all of them, too. We got to know Jesus around the same time, and around three years ago, when he had just started his traveling years. But what do you say to a stranger who tells you to leave your family and your home and your career and go with them? And what do you say about someone who asks you to do just that? And you do it. He was the kind of person you listen to. You listen to him from a deep place down inside of yourself. It was like he had words of life and he wanted you to listen. Or as my young friend John would say, it was like he was the word, the word of life. And he wanted to listen to him forever. And we listened and we listened. And I can't say that we always understood everything he had to say. Although God knows I tried. And Jesus was very patient, listening to our questions. And after he'd been teaching in the crowds, we'd set him aside and ask him what he really meant. And he would explain it all again to us. He had that kind of patience. Now, I'm a fisherman by trade. And anyone who knows me will tell you, I can work hard. But I didn't have half the energy that Jesus had. We would walk all day and Jesus would preach half the night to people. We could hardly hold our eyes open. And finally, we would get to bed somewhere. And in the morning, we would wake up and Jesus was long gone. He was out in the hills praying half the night. He got energy just by being with God. There was a power about Jesus that I've never seen in any other man, alive or dead. He spoke from a place of power, and he could change things with his word, with his touch. He spoke with power to those with sicknesses. He healed the blind and the lame. He could speak to demons, and they would obey him. And I know some of you all may find this hard to believe, but he could speak to the wind and to the storm, and they would obey him also. He spoke to a dead man and called him back to life. It may sound unbelievable, but we saw this with our own eyes. This was the kind of man he was, and in spite of all that amazing power, he was just one of us. He was our friend, and he cared for us talking to each of us about our troubles. He knew us through and through, traveling together. You know, you get to know somebody when you're together all the time. You get to know them really well. And sometimes you just don't get along. We were sometimes unreasonable and maybe angry, irritable, and anything else. But Jesus was always there encouraging us. And we came to see all of us, his disciples. We came to see that he wasn't just an ordinary person or even an ordinary prophet. We came to see him as the Messiah, the chosen one of Israel. Last Sabbath, we entered into Jerusalem and the whole city was out singing his praises and waving palm fronds. And we thought his time had come. We thought we would see him seated at his rightful place. But what happened next? It's bewildered all of us, and we've got no words to describe our horror and our grief. It was unthinkable, and yet it happened. I still don't know what to say or what to do. There are things I wish I could have undone, and things I wish I did not do. 
But what's done is done. And we all know that Jesus is buried behind a stone a foot thick, and no one can hurt him now which is about the only comfort that we have in these dark in this dark time. I can only say that Jesus was a savior to me. He showed me the way to live and I'll never forget it. Me and my friends, well, we're going to head back to Capernaum shortly. We're not heading back to, as the same people who left three years ago because Jesus changed us. If there was one thing Jesus would want, it would be that we should love one another and take care of each other in our grief. And Mary, I know how hard it is to give up your son, Jesus. When he took to this traveling life, then he missed that life back home too. But he did what he was called to do. And I know you knew it from the very beginning that he had a special calling in his life. I'm glad to see that John's taking care of you now. And I just ask that for all of us as we go from here. that we not just go our own way. But that we look out for each other. That we love one another just as he loved us. Amen.